On September the 11th, 2001, when terrorist attacks took place on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, President George W. Bush was not in Washington. And those who responded immediately to the crisis were his Vice President Dick Cheney and his closest advisor, his legal counsel David Addington. And these men decided almost immediately that what should have been regarded as a criminal act they were going to treat as an act of war. Within three days of the 9-11 attacks, the administration had persuaded Congress to pass the Authorization for Use of Military Force, the founding document of the War on Terror, which granted the President the right to pursue those responsible for the 9-11 attacks and those who had supported them. It was a short and very open-ended document, and it seemed to grant the President almost unlimited and undefined powers. The Geneva Conventions and uh, international law says, regardless who you capture, whatever they are, you've got to treat them humanely. And the government and Attorney General Gonzalez sort of confused all these things and said, well, if we don't need to treat them as prisoners of war, we don't need to treat them under the Geneva Conventions at all. And that's wrong. Soon after the authorization was passed, the U.S. administration demanded of the Taliban that they hand over Osama bin Laden and everyone connected with al-Qaeda. The Taliban said that they would do this if proof was provided that Osama bin Laden had been involved in the attacks, but no proof was forthcoming. So soon after the Americans invaded Afghanistan, on the 7th of October 2001, uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. Here we were, um fighting, according to George Bush, a war for democracy and the rule of law. And our first uh, step was to basically abolish the rule of law, to take prisoners to Cuba, for goodness sake, which the United States has said doesn't have any rule of law, and hold them there without any legal rights whatsoever. And it's that sort of hypocrisy that is the yeast that ferments hatred around the world. In 1215 in Runnymede, the nobles of England forced Prince John to sign a document called the Magna Carta. The most basic right of that is that no man can be deprived of his liberty except in accordance with the law and by a jury of his peers. The English courts really invented this writ of habeas corpus to enforce that right, to protect it. And depriving people of that uh, takes you back to the 11th century. And that's what the government of the United States has tried to do with foreigners at Guantanamo. The Americans were fighting what was essentially a proxy war. Small numbers of special forces operatives flew in. They had uh, land cruisers stuffed full of cash, and they were employing Afghan warlords to fight their battles for them. So the US forces were calling in the bombers that were used for the bombing raids that decimated the Taliban, but the actual fighting was down to the Afghans. And perhaps even more importantly, capturing of prisoners was down to the Afghans as well. The Geneva Conventions and U.S. military regulations require a hearing be held in the field close to the time of capture. If you have any doubt about who you're capturing, what he is, the U.S. government has very explicit regulations on that, implementing Article 5 of the Geneva Conventions. And the U.S. government has abided by that in every one of the wars since Vietnam, except for this one. The military wanted to hold those hearings, and the White House vetoed them. In the first Gulf War, for example, the United States held about 1,200 of these tribunals, and in three quarters of the cases, uh, realized that they had seized innocent people and sent them home. I tended to believe the statements made publicly by people like Don Donald Rumsfeld and George Bush that all of these prisoners had been captured on the battlefield of Afghanistan. I mean, they said it. They're, presumably, they're telling the truth. Well, we all now know that that's an absolute falsehood. The facts, their own facts show that, you know, most of them were not captured by the United States. The great majority weren't captured on the battlefield, but were turned over for bounties. Very few were even accused of being connected with al-Qaeda. The Americans had given out a, uh, an offer of a bounty. Uh, the, the normal fee was $5,000 for any sort of foreign Taliban 
who was turned over. Because if you translate that on annual income basis to, to say, Britain, would be about a quarter of a million dollars. So the question you have to ask yourself is this, if there's some person you either don't know or who you dislike, who you can turn into the Americans for a quarter of a million dollars and just make up a story saying, I saw that chap in Tora Bora, would you do it? Well, of course, many, many people did do that. The next major document in advancing the war on terror was a military order, which was passed stealthily in November 2001. Now, this was conceived in the office of the vice president, was almost certainly written by David Addington. And it's established that the president had the right to seize anybody anywhere in the world that he regarded as a terrorist and to hold them as an enemy combatant indefinitely without charge or trial. The U.S. government created this term enemy combatant. In a sense, it's confused everything. They haven't given a, a clear definition of it. At one time, they said it's somebody who is supporting a force hostile to the United States and engaged in combat. More recently, they said it's somebody supporting a force hostile to the United States or engaged in combat. So you could be one or the other, which is, is terribly confusing. In some cases, the people who were there had traveled to fight with the Taliban. They'd been recruited in their home countries, generally in the Gulf, to help the Taliban establish a pure Islamic state by defeating their enemies in the Northern Alliance. And this had all happened long before the 9-11 attacks. So it's clear that there's no connection between what was happening in Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda and 9-11. But there were people in Afghanistan for other reasons. Most of my clients said they were down in the Afghanistan-Pakistan area doing charitable work. People have, have mocked those explanations, say, oh, they all say that. Terrorists say that they were doing charitable work. But the studies of Afghanistan at that time showed that it was considered by the UN the worst disaster area in the world. Not only had it gone through years and years of civil war, but it had been through three or four years of, of terrible drought. The infrastructure was destroyed. And people, particularly uh, Arabs from oil-rich nations, went down there to do charitable work. And of course, what happened when war was declared was that uh, terrible situation became even worse and there were hundreds of thousands of refugees trying to flee Afghanistan. People who were coming to help out were coming because of the humanitarian crisis so they were arriving in the country after the invasion had begun. A Muslim cannot really be a true Muslim if he or she is not being charitable. It's an essential part of one's faith and that's why we find Muslims will, you know, if they find uh, there are other Muslims who are in need in different parts of the world. That bond of faith, you know, really makes them be charitable, charitable towards them. I'd already worked as part of an aid organisation in Bosnia. The issue of Afghanistan always was something that I thought about before having visited uh, um, there in '98 for a short time. And one of the things that I thought about the country was that it's a beleaguered country, it's a Muslim country, it's ruled by a, a harsh regime, which is the Taliban. But the reasons why they've come into power are also very important, i.e. that it's a popul it began as a populist movement. Um, and of course it's been shunned by the rest of the world. So there was at that time a drive within people, certain sections of the Muslim world, to try to not shun the country, but in fact inject it with some support to help it to, to be more open to the rest of the world. It's not a matter of where, you know, sometimes we see something and, you know, we're disposing of certain things. Okay, I'll give a 10 or a 50. There's no real attachment as such. But if a Muslim goes to those environments and sees the suffering of the people and then tries to help and then comes back and informs you know, his people in his country and says, look, I have seen the suffering of people in such and such a country. Please support these people, help these people. This again you know, is essential again to a Muslim. One of my guys, I will tell you, I found out when we were trying to get him out and he's still there, from the time he was seven years old, he split his allowance in half, half for himself, half for poor people. He's devoted his life to do these things and he's a, he's a wonderful guy. One of the men who traveled to Afghanistan uh, many months before the 9-11 attacks to take part in humanitarian aid projects was a British resident called Shaka Arma. 
Shakaram is somebody that I knew uh, well from before he went to Afghanistan with me. My friendship and his went back to, I think, around 97 when we first met in London. Just listening to him talking was, was absolutely uh, captivating. He's very kind, he's very generous, he's very uh, uh, larger than life. He's uh, a person that I think most people would be happy to call as their friend. His, his family are the most beloved thing to him in the world. And I suppose that's the thing that marked myself and him out in that we, when we moved to Afghanistan, we did so with our families. Shakir was the one who showed me the pictures and the photographs of this place and got me interested in this project to begin with. And then after that, uh, myself and him, we started raising funds for the school. We started um, helping to set a curriculum. It was only a few weeks before September 11th happened. And then of course, after that, the school was closed. And after the school was closed, it was also struck by a, a cruise missile. It was only when the rumblings of the Sixth Fleet being moved in for a tactical position so that it could strike into Afghanistan, and then we started thinking about packing our stuff up together. But we didn't leave at the time. We only left when the bombing actually began. What I understand is that he, like most people, um, tried to evacuate his family out first to make sure that they were safe. There was no police, no law and order. So foreigners, particularly mostly foreign Muslims, who were offered up as bounties, um, were being captured by people and turned over. The largest group of prisoners rounded up and sent to Guantanamo, almost a third of the prison's entire population, were captured in the space of a week, crossing from Afghanistan into Pakistan in December 2001. This was just after a conflict in Afghanistan's Tora Bora Mountains, where remnants of al-Qaeda and the Taliban had been holding out against US forces. And typically everybody who was captured was tarred as a member of al-Qaeda and the Taliban as a result. Now the problem with this scenario is that there were many, many more people other than just fighters who were fleeing from the death and destruction in Afghanistan following the US-led invasion and the fall of the Taliban. We thought the bombardment would go for a while and then everything would end up finished and just things go back to normal. So I didn't really rush to go out. But when it continued, there was people were serious about invading the country. So I had to leave. I left the country with my wife to where? To Lahore, Pakistan. Obviously, Lahore is very, very, very far away from the borders. It's nothing like a border where I was like caught in the borders or anything like that. I was in a large villa, rented a villa, going out and in without any, you know, like, I wasn't hiding. I was going every morning out to buy bread, buy things for my wife. My small kids, six months years old, are so happy. I really enjoyed even Pakistan. I liked it. The same system of bounty payments was being made available in, in Pakistan as was in Afghanistan and with the same terrible results. So Arabs in Pakistan were being pulled off buses, were being seized in the street, were being picked up in random raids on mosques. And all of them were packaged up as Al-Qaeda and Taliban and sold to US forces. Pakistan's President Musharraf, in his autobiography, um, admitted that in exchange for handing over hundreds of suspects to US forces, the Pakistani government received millions of dollars. I was sitting down playing with uh, Suleiman, laughing at him, because I had another visitor came from Afghanistan with her sister, she had a small daughter, a very nice daughter, a similar age to my son, Suleiman. And I was calling Maryam, my wife, saying, come Maryam, just come watch your, your child is frightened from this calm of head. And I'm just laughing and joking, it was the middle of the day. Suddenly I hear a scream from Maryam, they're saying, look, look out from the window, just look out. The police surrounded the house. I say, it can't be true, I was scared. I stand up in the window and I see police everywhere, like, like ants, everyone wearing black and holding guns in their hands. And they, surrounded the house and jumped inside the house. And they had, in English, stupidly, not even in Urdu or Pakistani, they had in English in their back written, no fear. The first thing they said is, where is your gun? Where is your gun? I said, I don't have a gun. I have a passport and visa. They collected some other people from somewhere else, from other houses, from other places. But there, and things was a shamble and chaos. And then they took us to another high security prison in Lahore. Yes. And I was transferred to, uh, from there to Islamabad. In Islamabad, was another session of, of torture again for a couple of days, which every time when you come to a new prison, usually torture becomes worse than when it's normal. This guy introduced himself as Andrew, and then he says, I'm British intelligence, am I Sussex or am I I can't remember. I said, I'm British national, and you're doing this to me. Instead of you helping those, those abducted me, kidnapped me here, 
your job is not to is to get me out of this place, not to be a collab, uh, you know, a party or to, to this thing that happens. Say one night they handed us, took us to the airport, and then handed us to the American. Suddenly, you know, they see Americans shouting. You know, when in a place like an airport, you can hear the planes, and then suddenly, the hood we had, the Pakistani hood, was taken off to another worse hood than the first one. The first hood was very thin and you could have some air. It was a signal of a new, a real hardship. You'd suffocate under that. I remember a clone in the plane and they used a, a rope and you can hear the e, 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 you know, something like that where the rope really pulls down, down, down and you can feel it's gonna cut you into pieces. And the way they bunked us all on top of each other, it was really, really like you moving furniture or something because you could feel somebody's leg is in your face and you're on the floor and you chained like that and there's somebody next to me was throwing up and you could imagine how suffocated he might have been and you could sometimes get a kick some, from somewhere I don't know what boot comes from where there are some still guards taking pictures you know click click you can hear pictures all over and you can smell uh, alcohol and stuff and then uh, we were set down to Bagram and the new story starts from there you know Bagram base yeah, with all the other horrible stuff. The first prison that the Americans established in Afghanistan was at Kandahar Airport in southern Afghanistan. But this is where hundreds of the prisoners who ended up at, at Guantanamo were processed from December 2001 through to the spring of 2002. At that point, um, Kandahar was essentially phased out and Bagram took over as the, the main prison where hundreds more prisoners were processed. And Bagram is still the main U.S. prison in Afghanistan to this day. Bagram is one of the most awful places that you could think of. The, the, the first thing that comes to the picture when you think of Bagram is like a concentration camp of what we know of a concentration camp in films. Large barbed place where they got barbed wires and then you got large big lights coming down. And then you have generators working all day and night. And it's so cold, and day and night it's cold, and it's difficult to sleep under those lights. And you've got people in top of uh, top places where they can look at you down with the guns, holding guns on you, and you think, this guy's crazy, he might just start shooting any time. It's so frightening because you can hear people screaming every day and night in those top rooms. And under those conditions, and under those circumstances, they were scary, cold, hunger. This is where the British delegate came in and interrogated us. People were like vomiting. I had malaria in my head. The other people were sick, throwing up. Toilets were open in front of everybody. You had number one, number two, you know, leftovers of human beings thrown in front. People were sick, diseases, everything, torture. People are dragged in front of people, in front of them, dragged to interrogation, kicked, shouting, screamed all over, over the place. And under those circumstances, not any other room, it, they didn't, not that they didn't see these things or they were taken to another part of the camp. And I said to him, just, just stand up and look. Just stand up and look down there. Look at the camp down there. Just look how it looks. Doesn't it look like the Nazi, you know, conditions and things like that? Just, just look at it. And they, like, you know, butted in. They knew what they, what they were doing was wrong. Having already failed to screen any of these men through battlefield tribunals, the U.S. authorities then compounded this error by refusing to screen them at all in Kandahar and at Bagram. What happened was that the prisoners were assigned numbers, the numbers were put on lists and were sent to a place called Camp Doha in Kuwait, where senior figures in the military and the intelligence services were overseeing the whole project. And the orders that came back from there stipulated that every single Arab who came into U.S. custody had to be sent to Guantanamo. There were no exceptions. Any doubts about who they were were unanswered at the time and in many cases remain unanswered to this day. We were kept there for two months, not allowed to speak at all. And if they saw me, there were a couple of guards. Some guards used to even lie, say, I saw you speak, come here, stand up, just because they didn't like you or something like that, because somebody felt probably you're too proud or probably they sensed something like that and they just, they say, him, him, he used to speak, I saw him speak, just come here. And what they do is like they, they chain you to the they chain you to the to the to the chains. You know there's a place where really horrible. You know you got barbed wires. They chain you to the barbed wires, and and they put this uh, cover, the black cover, and they tie it. You can feel suffocating, and you could feel your face 
burning and, and, and sweating and, and you'd be like, just imagine even more than that and, and, and your hand would be just chained up like that and in a way, very, very hard, stressful way. And this did happen not only once or twice, but let's say tens of times, you know, it happened. Because every time they see me speak, they'd say, come down to the chains and they chain you. And it was, you can't keep quiet for two months. I mean, it's impossible. I mean, we used to speak, yes. Sometimes they caught us, sometimes they didn't. But when they caught us, the punishment was really, it wasn't easy. I think that was hard. The, the, the suffocation part of things was hard. And if, obviously, the, the, the electricity shocks and things like that, they'll joke about it, they'll come down with the, the gun and you don't know what's going on because you, just, you can't even see and somebody just hit you with a gun and it's like you, know, you can hear the scream crossing the whole camp so hard that you fall down from it and they'll just laugh they just make it like a joke and they come around doing it and all sorts of stuff you know the water standing up and throwing the buckets of cold water in the wind and things like that. there's all sorts of awful things used to happen there I think Bagram was uh, probably even worse than Guantanamo yeah it was a bad place I had no concept that the United States could be abusing people I didn't think it was possible and uh, then we saw the pictures of Abu Ghraib Every one of the detainees I have talked to had been badly abused. The worst abuse was when they were originally taken into custody in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Each of them were thrilled to be in U.S. custody. They said, you know, they knew they would be treated well and fairly from the first night in captivity. They were badly abused. And, and none of them, by the way, had seen pictures of Abu Ghraib. But they, had, they all described experiences almost exactly similar to those pictures. Being stripped naked, paraded before female guards, dogs barking at them. Uh, even worse in Abu Ghraib, uh, they described being hung by their wrists and with electric shocks put to them. Some uh, hung upside down with electric shocks put to them. When I heard these stories, and they were told by people who weren't trying to um, emphasize this, but I actually I had to draw it out of them. And they were embarrassed about how they had been treated. Um, I was just shocked, appalled. And, uh, and it was everywhere, and every one of them. When I was first taken into Kandahar, um, Shakir had been there a few weeks before I was, and then he'd been amongst the first group of people that was shipped off to Guantanamo. And having spoken to interrogators there who asked me about him, I mean, they were, first of all, they were very um, impressed by his his, his, his behaviour, his attitude, his willingness to speak to them and to, to try to explain things to them. And yet they were also worried about his character in that if no justice is offered, then I will resist. And part of his resistance began, I think, at that time in Kandahar, which included a hunger strike, also telling the other people that uh, we can't accept this type of behaviour with us. We're, all, we're human beings and we need to be treated like that. Shaka was held in Kandahar for, for several months and he's been very unwilling to talk about what happened to him there. Now I've heard from other prisoners what happened to him there and I've got that unclassified through them because he was abused I think almost more than any other prisoner because, and this is, this is just a typical example of how this works, Shaka speaks very eloquent fluent English, he's a very eloquent man and he will not stand for injustice. And so he became immediately the spokesperson for the other prisoners because most of them didn't speak English. So in, immediately the American military assumed that he's some big Al-Qaeda leader simply because he's the one who's doing the talking. Shakir was brought into, into interrogation from what I was told by an interrogator and the guard uh, with his hands tied behind his back. Uh, his legs shackled, pushed onto the floor, hood placed over his head, dragged onto the ground, a, a gun put to him, and he, killed, he got up smiling. This was a problem for many of the English, you know, British-based prisoners, because they were actually the only ones who spoke English. Um, and as a consequence, Shaka went to frightful, frightful abuse in, in Kandahar. Rendition, simply put, is a process of kidnapping somebody in, in one country and transferring them to another place. 
Now, the way that the Americans have done this, which has happened since the 19th century, was to pursue wanted criminals to other countries and to bring them back to face justice in the American court system. And this was something that was still happening in the 1990s, in that um, wanted terrorist suspects were brought back to justice in the United States. What also happened in the 1990s was that extraordinary rendition first emerged. Now, this is a process where instead of bringing them back to America, prisoners are sent to other countries where they can be either disappeared or can be tortured on behalf of the US administration. The countries that the Americans chose to send people to to be tortured on behalf of them is frankly bizarre. It included Egypt, Morocco, Jordan, it included Syria. If Guantanamo's bad, where prisoners didn't see lawyers for four years and where even now it's very difficult, Imagine how much worse it is when you're in one of those really dark secret prisons and you never get to see anybody apart from your abusers. Behind the scenes in America, discussions were taking place about whether the Americans could do these kind of activities themselves. And this was resolved in the summer of 2002 when the CIA began running secret prisons. The CIA had never done that kind of thing before. And effectively, torture was brought in-house. Now, a particularly brutal example of extraordinary rendition and torture, both by proxy torturers and by the CIA's own torturers, is a man called Binyam Mohammed, originally from Ethiopia, a British resident who had come to London as a teenager in the 1990s and had settled here. He lived here for seven years, um, did some education here. Then he, he worked at the Heritage Centre, it's basically a Muslim centre, in Kensington. Binyam is a really, really nice guy. He is a really nice guy, a really funny guy from London, Ludbrook Grove, where he used to. He was, a, yeah, he was non Muslim and then he turned, came to Islam through friends, I think. He used to be a drug addict, I heard. He really wanted to kick the habit because it was wrecking havoc with his whole life. And uh, so ultimately he was trying to figure out how to do that and he got some advice which seemed to make a lot of sense at the time which was back then one of the places paradoxically that was famous for being pretty drug free was Afghanistan. Well, I got to know him in prison and he was one of the greatest you know personality you could be next to in a sense he was like sense for humor, funny, nice guy. Binyam was grabbed by the Pakistanis at immigration and turned over to the Americans. It was Binyam's immense misfortune that he had been living in America and he knew his legal rights. And Binyam said, I'm not talking to you people. I know my rights. I have nothing to do with America. Now bring the British here if you want, I'll talk to them because I live in Britain, but I've got nothing to do with the United States. Now the moment you assert your right to remain silent to any American police officer, let alone the FBI in Pakistan, that immediately makes them assume that you've got something you're hiding. So then they start conjuring up what it is you're hiding. It doesn't take long to put two and two together and make five when they discover that Binyam was on the same flight as Jose Padilla back on April the 3rd. They think, well, there must be a connection. These two people speak English. Jose Padilla is an American citizen who was seized in May 2002 as he came back from Pakistan and was imprisoned as an enemy combatant in the US mainland um, for three and a half years. And now he's the main person associated with the uh, alleged dirty bomb plot with which Binyam Mohammed later became associated. No one stops to think that actually they were headed in totally different places and this was just a flight to Zurich that many people took as a cheap flight. But they immediately begin to add this together and decide that these two people had to be in on this, this plot. And then quite where they come up with this plot, I don't know. But Binyam's told me that they basically forced him to say various things. They forced him to say that he was involved in a, a dirty bomb plot uh, where they were going to make a bomb and explode it in New York. They forced him to say various things that are just incredibly stupid that they've subsequently run away from. For example, they made him say that Jose Padilla was running around trying to buy nuclear fission material in Asia. Well, Binyam, to his great credit, when you go back and you add 
everything up, made these statements effectively saying that Jose Padilla was, was searching for this fission material on April the 1st. Well, that's April Fool's Day. Now, the other side of it that's really important with Binyam is this. If I torture you and I get you to admit something that's false, then, you know, it's tough luck for you. You may go to prison based on a false confession. But there's only one person who suffers from that, and that's the victim of a false confession. Hugely different if I torture you and get you to make a statement that seemingly threatens the entire United States. What happened was then Attorney General John Ashcroft interrupted his press conference in, in Moscow to say, we have just solved the dirty bomb plot where a nuclear bomb was going to go off in New York. And my goodness, aren't we clever? We've solved this thing. But doesn't this show how very, very dangerous these Muslim extremists are? Soon after, Paul Wolfowitz, the Deputy Defence Secretary, admitted that there was no dirty bomb plot, that Padilla's investigations had gone no further than um, an internet search. They started making him confess to various other things to implicate other people in this plot. And again, when you look at it, it's very, very interesting because they have him say that he had dinner uh, on April, I think the 2nd, it would be, 2002, with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin al-Sheib, Abu Zubaydah, Sheikh al-Libi, and Jose Padilla. Well, there are a couple of things that are consistent about those people. At some point, all of them were in U.S. custody. So these were people who they wanted to try, and they wanted to, you know, try in some military tribunal for the worst crime imaginable, which would be a bomb in downtown Manhattan. There are some reasons why you and I might doubt the whole process. First, Binyam didn't speak Arabic, so what was he doing having dinner with these guys? But equally, how come four of the top six people in Al-Qaeda were having a farewell dinner with Binyam Mohammed before he flew away from Pakistan? What had these people done uh, coming hundreds and hundreds of miles from Afghanistan to South Pakistan to have this farewell dinner? I mean, the whole thing is basically silly. Of course, it becomes slightly sillier when you recognize that both Al-Libi and Zubaydah were in U.S. custody at the time this dinner was meant to have taken place. So all of this bullshit, and that's the only legal term I can come up for it, um, just illustrates the fact that they've tortured him into saying something that is patently false. And he went through some pretty bad stuff, you know, gun in his mouth and all that sort of thing. But that was nothing compared to what was uh, in store for him in Morocco. What happened with rendition after 9-11 was that the whole thing just expanded in the most extraordinary manner um, and became kidnapping and rendition on an industrial scale. Uh, we still don't know how many hundreds of people or possibly thousands uh, were disappeared. The Americans say that no one was taken for torture and abuse anywhere around the world. They cannot deny that Binyam Mohammed was taken to Morocco because we got the flight logs, which prove it. Now, Binyam's not from Morocco, and he sure as hell wasn't going to Morocco for a club med vacation. So what was he doing, being taken there by the CIA? There's really only one answer to that for any sensible person, and that is he was going for some of these enhanced interrogation techniques. What he went through in Morocco was quite horrific. And you've got to ask yourself why. He cracked very early on, as all of us would, and he would say anything these people wanted to say. And at one point he asked them, why are you doing this to me? And they said, we're doing this simply to train you, sort of Pavlovian conditioning, so that you will always do what your American masters want you to do. And that's basically tell this evolving story about the dirty bone plot. And what they did to him was unspeakable. Um, you know, every week or two weeks while he was in Morocco, they would take a razor blade to his penis, for goodness sake. And, uh, you know, the, the description of that is, is quite horrific. But even that wasn't the worst. Binyam says, look, it's one thing for them to try and break me physically. That's physical pain. And you know it's coming, you know it's going to end, and that's that. By far the worst, in a way, was the psychological torture, because 
losing your mind is so much worse than losing almost anything else. And he describes the drugs they used on him. He's a former drug addict, desperate to try and kick it. And, you know, they're just filling him up with drugs and making him get withdrawal symptoms all the time. But uh, he also describes the cold, this, the damp, and, and the noise. And the noise was something that he describes as being uh, some of the worst things he suffered. One of the things that Binyam found the hardest in his experience was when it became obvious that the British were complicit in the process. He first met a British intelligence officer in Pakistan. Two of them came to see him, and he was happy to talk to him, and he told them whatever they wanted to know. And they reported to him that they'd checked him out and confirmed that he was a nobody, which is true. That's what Binyam said, he's nobody. They told him, effectively, that he was going to the Middle East. They told him that he'd better put more sugar in his tea where he was going, which was a sort of veiled reference that Binyam understood to mean he was going to an Arab country to face a bunch of abuse. And, you know, he basically confirmed that with them, that they knew he was headed for torture. They did nothing to prevent that. It got worse when he was in Morocco because the Moroccans who were interrogating him would come out with information that could only have come from Britain. On January the 21st, 2004, an, a second CIA plane came to Morocco and took Binyam to Kabul in, uh, in Afghanistan, and he describes how he was taken from the airport to what has become known as the dark prison. They kept it dark all the time. They played blasting music at him all the time. It's January, so it's freezing cold in there. And it, the way he describes it, it's, it's like a medieval prison, you know, where he's shackled up against the walls and uh, barely got any clothes on and is, you know, dirty, doesn't get to shave or clean himself. And, you know, you just have this picture of this ghastly thing from the Middle Ages, which is basically what it is and is where we should send it right back to the Middle Ages where it belongs. But he spent uh, several months there undergoing more abuse, and this time it was very much under the control of the Americans explicitly. There was another secret prison near Kabul called the Salt Pit, um, and there were also secret prisons in Thailand, in Poland, in Romania, um, and we strongly suspect on the British island of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Egypt, Syria even, Morocco, Ethiopia have held a large number of prisoners. For a lot of these prisoners, their whereabouts are still unknown. But what we do know is that around 40 prisoners seized in 17 different countries, um, apart from Pakistan and Afghanistan, ended up passing through one or other of these secret prisons and being taken to Guantanamo in the end, along with Binyam Mohammed. From Pakistan to, to Bagram was 45 minutes, but from that place to Cuba, from Guantanamo, it was a really long, long, long journey. The flight to Guantanamo was an excruciatingly painful one, even from before the flight began, which included being having the, the three-piece suit, which is a, a, a pair of handcuffs that are attached to a, a waist chain, and that waist chain then is, is padlocked, and from the waist chain uh, is another chain that goes down to another set of chains which, which uh, are attached to the ankles. And I remember losing my senses completely. Seriously, I lost my senses completely. And I hallucinated them the way. And they, it was really horrible. They had covers, hand covers, like really big hand covers. And they had something closing the, the ears. The goggle was so hard on the eyes and you can't move it because you were like tied down like this to the waist. The elastic was so hard, there was pulling in, cutting in and cutting in throughout the journey. When we got to Guantanamo, you had really bruises from here, cuts from here, cuts from here. You're then tied uh, or shackled to a chair from which you can't physically move. You can't get up, you can't go to the toilet, you can't eat. I remember even if um, I wanted to eat something, they gave me a sandwich on the journey. A soldier had to come and put it in my mouth. I couldn't hold it. So it was like being a child. It was, it was, it was like being paralysed almost. It was terrible. It was uh, one of the worst. That journey is is worse than the whole, probably you could put that in one, in one side and you could put the whole treatment in Gantan on one side. Just one journey, one journey, but it was a hell of a journey, I think.
and then they took us to take numbers and things and I, I was taken straight to the hospital because they felt I was really you know a box of nothing really and the first night I was in hospital in that kind of stage sick dead finished off physically psychologically everything I was finished and they had interrogation session. This was the first interrogation session of the same night. The reason that the Bush administration chose Guantanamo Bay was that they thought they could get away with making it effectively a law-free zone, a black hole. The government's entire argument throughout the case has been that foreigners outside the sovereign territory of the United States have no rights, have no legal rights and no right to go to court. And they really put the prisoners in Guantanamo for that purpose, for the explicit purpose of depriving them of rights, of having this argument. Our response to that, of course, was that because the environmental laws apply to Guantanamo, uh, and therefore an iguana has lots of rights, I mean, if an American soldier tramples on an iguana, the soldier is liable to $10,000 fine and 10 years in prison, that at the very least our clients, foreign nationals, should have equal rights with the iguanas. Guantanamo was the perfect place for them because it's under the complete jurisdiction and control of the United States, but technically um, Cuba has sovereignty over it or, or formal sovereignty. So the government could argue, well, look, somebody else has sovereignty, so they don't have legal protections, but we can control them. It was a first step, really, to establishing offshore prisons outside the law. The camp that was built for the first prisoners who arrived at Guantanamo in January 2002 was the notorious Camp X-Ray. These were the cages open to the elements which, which really resembled the kind of cages that you would keep animals in. When I came was just when they closed X-Ray camp and they started to move people to cages. They had a bit of a roof from top, part roof, a part roof from the other side and then the, if, if rain comes down We'll go into it straight into the cell. Compared to Camp 5, where I was moved afterwards, most of my four years were spent in Camp 5. I think those cages was like a paradise because it was air coming in. You could see the sun, at least from the cages. Sometimes you used to watch birds and you used to really like that. We used to throw some food to them. You could speak to people because you're in a cage. Another guy is next to you in a cage, so you could see him, speak to him. It was 50 cages in one place. And you can imagine the noise and the chatting and, did, 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 and banging and if there's a fight or there's a, somebody ill or anything, you can hear the banging and things and this was like sleeping in the streets. The prisoners who have spoken about their experiences of the early days have said that although the kind of casual everyday brutality of Afghanistan wasn't there, the psychological fear was enormous. The men were not told where they were, they were deliberately not told where they were and they had no idea what was going to happen to them. Many of them feared that at any moment they were going to be yanked out of these animal cages and, and taken away and shot. I mean, those cages were better than the, the complete isolation where you couldn't see any light. You were under horrible blazing light for 24 hours, no sleep. Under AC conditioner, really turned on very high, so it was like sleeping in a fridge. The room was like concrete and the bed was concrete no windows, nothing. You were obviously more tortured there, anything can happen to you, because cages, you always got people spitting at them, throwing stuff, water, and things like that. In uh, isolation, it's even more worse. It's only you are alone, and you're standing against everybody, guards, and things like that. It's very hard with the soldiers there, because I hate to tar them all with the same brush. There's a lot of decent people who are required to do a very indecent job. These soldiers, by and large, have been filled up with so much nonsense. In my case, I think that they'd already ratcheted up my status to a, a high-level um, detainee. They took me to what's known as Camp Echo, which was exclusively um, isolation. Um, and people have been told that I'm a high-ranking member of Al-Qaeda, that I'm very dangerous, that I can do press-ups on one arm, uh, um, I can, that I, I'm an assassin. There are all sorts of rumours and all sorts of truths mixed up with falsehoods. Um, that I'm a martial artist, yes, but in, in reality I'm only a blue belt in Taekwondo. Um, that I'm multilingual, yes, well that's unsurprising considering that most Asians are uh, in this country. Uh, and things like that, which ratcheted up your position and your status in the eyes of the intelligence or not so intelligent intelligence services. I remember some of the guards used to have like chains. And on those chains every guard had a number on it. 
a name. And we asked them, what are these chains? And what are these names? They said, each chain is a name of somebody who died in those buildings in September 11. Those were the guards who were guarding us and fighting with us and such. And that's how they kept that cruelty alive in those kids' hearts. And as soon as the guards get to know people and get to know those are normal human beings, they're not the people who bombed September 11, nothing to do with them. Some of them from Spain, some of them from Sweden, some of them from England, I don't know what. And they're nothing to do with New York. And as soon as they come to realize that after five months, four months, they are six months, they are moved and knew some stupid kids coming in, new guards brainwashed to do the same job that the others haven't finished. What actually happened in an unguarded moment about a month after the prison opened was that Brigadier General Mike Leonard of the Marines, who was the prison's first commander, admitted to reporters that uh, they'd been interrogating the men, but although they had established that a small number were Al-Qaeda, a slightly larger number were involved with the Taliban, the rest of the prisoners in the middle, this vast number of prisoners, they had absolutely no idea who they were. A delegation came to the White House from the CIA to say that they were going to have great difficulty interrogating the prisoners if they were restricted by the Geneva Conventions. Now, the Geneva Conventions prohibit any coercive interrogation whatsoever. And yet, within two weeks, President Bush had decided that the prisoners at Guantanamo were not protected by the Geneva Conventions. This was a big change because in the, in the early days, in November 2001, he had been extremely reluctant to deprive the prisoners of the Geneva Conventions, even though Dick Cheney had adamantly been pushing for it. In August 2002, almost certainly under the direction of Dick Cheney and David Addington, two lawyers within the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, John Yu and Jay Bybee, put together a memo that purportedly redefined torture. It's not possible to redefine torture. We understand what torture means. The UN Convention Against Torture makes it clear that it's the deliberate infliction of suffering on a person. What Bybee and you did in an attempt to justify what the administration was doing was to redefine torture so that it, the pain inflicted must be equivalent in intensity to the pain accompanying serious physical injury such as organ failure, impairment of bodily function, or even death. These legal opinions from this particular department within the Justice Department are considered so extraordinarily influential that that's how they're regarded. And what happened was that Cheney and Addington knew that, and they used them to provide them with the phony legal advice that would justify everything that they were planning to do. When I talked to my clients, they all told about abuse. We now know through memos that have been released by the FBI uh, that, of the abuse at Guantanamo and other places. I mean, systematic abuse. There's no doubt that the information down there is, uh, is replete with, uh, with allegations derived through torture, and it's corrupted. The whole thing is corrupted. It's useless. Prisoners indicated how Korans uh, were tossed in uh, buckets which were used as, for toilets. Korans were uh, recklessly tossed on the ground uh, during searches of the cells when I was there. Um, Korans, I've also learned, were used in the interrogation room in which interrogators threw Korans on the floor in front of shackled prisoners, stepped on it, kicked it, and things like that. Religious abuse, sexual abuse, hooding, stripping, isolation, stress positions, the use of extreme heat and cold. These were all techniques that were applied at Guantanamo to dozens and dozens of the prisoners there. And they were drawn from techniques which were taught in US military schools, which had been taken from torture techniques that were used by the Chinese communists on captured US soldiers in the Korean War to make them produce false confessions. So these were reverse engineered for use in Guantanamo. And how something that was designed by the Chinese to produce false confessions was supposed to produce anything resembling the truth in this context is absolutely beyond me. There are some people in the United States who believe 
the torture probably works. Their basis for believing that isn't based on any studies. If you, if you talk to um, actually the Secret Service in, in England or, or in Israel, they will say it's, it's a useless thing to do. But the people who believe in it working believe in it because they watch a program like 24 on television in Washington. And I, I think George Bush looks at it and says, oh, this is useful. And he looks at it. I mean, there's no foundation for it. And let's, let's make some decisions and some rules again. And if anyone violates them, or any lawyer like Gonzalez um, says you can do it or looks for legal excuses, they should be prosecuted and sent to jail. So probably George Bush. This whole package of enhanced interrogation techniques, the torture techniques, it wasn't applied to everybody in Guantanamo, but it was applied to about one-sixth of the total number of prisoners who were held there. And it was applied not because they knew anything about them, but because, but because they didn't. They picked out people that they thought were significant. So anybody who spoke English, for example, was in for a particularly bad time. Anybody who'd been to America uh, was subject to extraordinarily bad treatment because they figured that they were part of a sleeper cell. They were about to launch attacks within the United States. There were other techniques used that were applied to a smaller number of prisoners who were regarded as particularly significant. And the most notorious of these techniques was waterboarding. It's a form of controlled drowning. It's been recognized as a torture technique for centuries. When the Spanish Inquisition used it, they had the honesty to call it tortura del agua, torture by water. But when it came to the Bush administration, which was attempting to redefine torture, then they didn't recognize it as such. It was simply another enhanced interrogation technique which had been legally approved. It wasn't only a temporary thing that might damage you temporarily, but it is something that will go to the core of your physical spirit and physically. Of course, you can't. We were injected with stuff. We don't know what it is. We don't know when it comes out. Although each of of the detainees I've spoken to was badly abused physically, uh, I don't think that's the biggest thing to them. The biggest thing is not having a hearing. For over two years, the only people from the outside world who were allowed into Guantanamo were representatives of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Now, they're normally sworn to secrecy, but they had been so upset by what they were seeing at Guantanamo that they began speaking out about it. We brought suit on May 1st of 2002, asking uh, for the writ of habeas corpus, basically just for a fair hearing. Um, the government opposed it. The government said that because these people are foreigners held outside U.S. sovereign territory, they have no legal rights and no right to go to court. The lower court, uh, the district court, agreed with the government. Uh, they agreed with the government. Of course, it was, in the, it was right in the midst of all of the frenzy and hysteria of September 11th. The Court of Appeals then agreed with them. Then we went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court accepted the case, which it doesn't need to, and we, um, we won before the Supreme Court in June of 2004. The Supreme Court held that these people, even though foreigners, at Guantanamo had the right to go to the U.S. court with the writ of habeas corpus to test the legality of their detention. They did that really for political reasons as much as anything, that the, the truth of Abu Ghraib had come out not long before that. And up to that point, really most people didn't care. And however pious and sanctimonious the, the media in Europe is today, they didn't care either. The government came back and first it said, well, they may have the right to go to court, but they don't have the right to lawyers. So we had to go back to court, and the court said, well, they have the right to lawyers. We didn't have the right to go visit them, really, until uh, the end of 2004, the beginning of 2005. First time I could go down and meet them. It's incredibly difficult to have trust with prisoners in Guantanamo because, first, these are people who have been tortured. And if you look at torture victim syndrome, the psychological um, syndrome, um, one of the things you learn is someone who's been tortured has lost their entire faith in humanity. And that's not surprising. I mean, you walk around the world every day expecting there to be some guarantee that people aren't going to come and drag you off the street and start torturing you. And when you are tortured, that shatters your entire belief in the world. 
And so people don't trust their own mothers when they've been victims of torture. So how are they going to trust some guy who walks in and says, hi, I'm American, I'm here to help you. And all of us as lawyers have to be American citizens. I am too. Got to say, it, I was nervous when I first went down there. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I had only recently seen uh, some of their files, and first only the unclassified files. I was shocked by the lack of any evidence. But I didn't know really what they'd be like, and um, I didn't know how they'd react to me. And um, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a very moving experience. You walk into a small room, the detainee is sitting behind a table with his legs chained to a, a steel eyelet in the floor. Most of them were unbelievably thin. Um, gave me the impression that they had almost been starving. I was impressed how nice most of them were to talk with. They, they each told me that they had been interviewed before by people who were told, told them they were their lawyers. I should say, we, we got permission to have a tape from the family, a, a CD from the families introducing us. Um, it was uh, incredibly moving. Some of them cried in seeing their families. You know, they, they had been in captivity for three years. When I first saw Binyam in Guantanamo, he was very much more open than I would expect first seeing a prisoner there. And we spent three days. I mean, it was the most harrowing three days that I can remember in my whole life, actually, of me just sitting there taking notes on his story of torture and abuse. I remember one point he said to me, you know, I'm really sorry, I can't show any emotion, you'll have to fill that in, but I'm kind of dead in the head. It's just all been driven out of me. Shakir Armour was someone who was well respected by prisoners and US guards alike. He had a lot of influence on people. He used to tell lots of jokes. Shakir used to really, really laugh. If he comes to a block, he'll like light in it. I mean, block of 50, just imagine, block of 50 will be, if Shaka was in the, you know, in that block, that block would be like a dead block turned into life. I dealt with him very often, as he often had a list of complaints and concerns for me to address to the leadership. I do know he was someone, because of, of his leadership abilities, received, I would say, harsher treatment from, from the command. People liked him and respected him because of his personality and they looked at him as like an elder brother and he'd translate for people, he'd fight for them and if he had any problem in the block he'd shout at the guards, why are you taking this from him? He, the rules say this and that, call the SOG, call the officer, call, until he get you your rights. And this is the kind of person, he'd cry if he sees somebody really in pains or something, he'd cry. There are no formal accusations against Shaka that have remained sort of consistent and comprehensible throughout the time I've represented him. I honestly don't know what I'm meant to respond to on his behalf. It seems absolutely ludicrous to me, this notion that he's meant to be some sort of soulmate of bin Laden. There is absolutely no evidence of that. And, you know, I, I don't know where that comes from. They haven't told me. They haven't suggested. I, I can guess, and my guess would be that some other poor soul who's been tortured and abused has made that thing up just because they know that Shaka is a very well-spoken person, very eloquent, and therefore the Americans would believe it. And you see endless informants like this who make stuff up that's total nonsense. And it's so, so hard to disprove it very often. Nine days after the Supreme Court ruled that they had the right to go to court, the government put in place a system of tribunals at Guantanamo uh, called Combatant Status Review Tribunals, CSRTs. Panels of three military officers um, would review whether these people were enemy combatants. None of these tribunals made a, a decision from the beginning looking at the evidence because the uh, order establishing these tribunals said that the decisions have already been made by people, but now you review them. Indeed, the decisions had been made uh, by uh, higher up people who had continuously said that all the people in Guantanamo are bad guys and enemy combatants. 
and then these panels of three military officers, junior officers, were asked to review the decisions by their superiors. At these panels, the uh, people at Guantanamo were not allowed to see any accusation against them that which the government considered classified. And almost all of the panels, all of the panels, excuse me, relied on classified information. So the, the, the detainees were not allowed to see them or rebut them. Uh, to the extent there were accusations against them, they weren't allowed to know who made the accusations. They also weren't allowed lawyers. Um, and predictably, in about 95 percent of the cases, the panels determined that the people were, in fact, enemy combatants. In, those, in a few cases where they determined that they weren't enemy combatants, new panels were convened to determine that they were. They were do-over panels, sometimes two or three do-overs. So it was a sham procedure. Now, these were a horrible, belated echo of the battlefield tribunals that were supposed to have taken place when the prisoners were first captured. But when you do them three years later, after decisions have already been made, it's, you can't do it then. They chain you, they pull you, drag you out, and they, you come and you stand. What is it? You got a commissioner, somebody standing, an officer standing, somebody sitting down, somebody reading paper. Wait, just listen. You, know, you are a common combatant, you've been charged with this, you've been done this, you've done that. You don't know even what's going on. Then say, finish, you understand, you have anything to say? Okay, take him back to his cell, bring somebody else. And they went through like this for everybody. The whole camp went like that. It's a mess. It's like a, a joke. The government then moved in court to dismiss the cases on a legal theory uh, which only U.S. lawyers could invent, uh, that said, well, although they had the right to habeas corpus, because they were foreigners outside the United States, they had no substantive legal rights that could be enforced. We argued that case. We won it before the district court. As we were arguing it before the Court of Appeals, Congress then stepped in and revoked the right to habeas corpus. It took until June 2008 for the Supreme Court to make its decision, its second decision, about the prisoners' habeas corpus rights. That they'd had habeas corpus rights for four years since the Supreme Court had first given them to them. But that this time round, their rights were constitutionally guaranteed, that there was no way, as before, that Congress could come along and change the law. That if the rights were to be taken away from them this time, it would have to be by actually changing the U.S. Constitution. One of the things that's been most disappointing to me is the failure of the U.S. legal system to provide them with the most basic element of fair hearing. They have come to believe that the system is a joke, that the U.S. legal system is a joke. It simply doesn't work, that it's all political that the administration, the U.S. government, can delay justice as long as it wants, and it can have the courts sanctify that. Perversely, the only prisoners in Guantanamo who had any opportunity to tell their stories to the wider world were those prisoners who were regarded as so significant, so dangerous, that they were put forward for trial by military commission, the special trial system that had been invented in November 2001. I have great respect for Binyam because for everything he's been through, he's maintained a tremendous sense of humor. And he was charged in those kangaroo courts, the military commissions. He really seized that courtroom. And I thought he made the whole system look ridiculous. It's like sort of standing in front of a Latin American hunter. You've got seven colonels up there and they're all handpicked by the Bush administration. And Binyam says, what should we call this place? I mean, I know you people call it a military commission. I don't think that'll do. You know, we can't call it a court, because it's not a court, is it? This isn't really a court. We could call it a room, but that's rather boring. I tell you what we'll call it. Let's call it a con mission. It's a mission to con the world that there's justice in Guantanamo. And he'd written out this card that he held up that said con mission. And, you know, everything he did there was to expose the fact that the emperor wears no clothes. They wanted him, talking about clothes, to dress up in cuddly western sweaters and make him look like he was just a civilian. He didn't want that. He wanted the world, because finally the media was in the courtroom, he wanted the world to see the truth. He insisted he wanted to start wearing orange, because they stopped giving us orange. After three years, they started to divide people into levels. At one level, you're orange. On another level, if you're better, 
you brown and if you're another level you're white or something if you can't fall and he said no he wants to go out with orange <laughs> he insisted on the orange boiler suit to go out with it to the designation you know the day he goes to the trial and I said what he just he said I don't know why he had something in his head about the orange boiler suit and I said uh, they refused the Americans refused to give him the orange boiler suit and he made a real big fuss about it and he's really angry about it and he said now I asked Clive to bring me a Holland shirt you know, a Holland uh, football team shirt, and it was orange. <laughs> and that's just the message he wanted to get across to the world, is that this courtroom is a farce, and that what's going on just outside those doors is they're strapping me up again in all these shackles, putting me in this cage and taking me back to my awful cell. They've not even considered Shaka to come up for trial by military commission. So evidently it's because of what he's become in Guantanamo, and that is an advocate for the rights of the detainees. He was put on the prisoner's council. There was a very brief time for just a few days in July and August 2005 when the prison actually respected the Geneva Conventions and had a prisoner's council for the prisoners. And Shaka was the secretary of the six-person council. But the moment they decided that enough was enough and the military reneged on their promises, then Shaka was put in isolation. And from September the 24th, 2005, he's almost all the time been in total isolation in Camp Echo. A lot of my time was spent in Guantanamo, or the majority was spent in Camp Echo isolation, which I believe is where Shaka still is. After one and a half years of being there, they installed cameras so that the soldiers whom, with whom you could or could not, depending on their persona, have discussion with, they're no longer there. All you have watching you is a camera, and that's even worse because there really is nobody to talk to at all. It's better to sp speak to a soldier uh, or a guard than to no one at all. And I think part of that process also means that, um, or necessitates, that when an interrogator does come, you will be more likely to speak to him just for the sake of having some human company. You described uh, how his whole body and bones would ache because in these prison cells you essentially don't have any mattress or anything to sleep on except the hard steel bed that that is bolted to the wall. I think people are kept there today more because of their behavior at Guantanamo than any thought about why they were captured. The only way to make a statement is through hunger strike. The only way that people understand outside that we are in a such a horrible state is hunger strike. Because if we say something that it twisted and changed. Because Shakir was so um, involved in the hunger strikes and so determined that the hunger strike was a way forward uh, to change the situation in Guantanamo, they, the authorities reacted by force feeding him, which included him being tied to a chair with his head tied back, with his hands and legs tied down, and a, a, a tube, a nasal tube being inserted into his nose and forced down into his stomach and liquid food pumped into it. Somebody goes on hunger strike. The U.S. government considers that an act of war. You know, I mean, these guys, they're furious that they're there and they have nothing to do. What they do is they put the tube up his nose and they pull it out every time. And they do that to make it more painful. General Craddock said in the New York Times that they were doing this new method of sticking this 110 centimeter tube up his nose and pulling it out every time they feed him twice a day to make it inconvenient for the prisoners to go on a peaceful non-violent hunger strike. Somebody by the name of Abdurrahman Wahsh, Abdurrahman Sharif, the tube was torn inside his stomach but they had to have an operation to get the tube out. Sometimes they take it out from one person and put it down to the other person without even cleaning it or getting another tube and they did all sorts of things to Really, they wanted to scare them off the hunger strike because they want to end it because some of them went on to two years hunger strike. That type of humiliation is something that I don't think even I could bear, to be honest. I don't know how I would deal with that. I think I would really, even being a, a calm person, would absolutely crack up if that happened to me. Interrogator said to us, you will be released one day, yes. You will be released, I'll tell you that, you will be released. But you will not be released from this place until you are broken wrecks. We will release you, you are terrorists. And we will release you, yes. But you will be physically finished, psychologically finished, and you will be nothing in your houses, only your wives, your mothers, your daughters will, you know, work 
to keep you alive? During my time that I was uh, threatened with execution, threatened with long-term imprisonment, which included decades before my, my case would even be reviewed or looked at. But I think probably the worst thing for me um, was family. That all of these years, I can't retrieve them ever again. That my children are growing up, my child, uh, youngest child has been born. I've never seen him now, he's almost three years old. Shakir's youngest child has never seen him. Never even seen him. And even the worst convicted criminals on earth are allowed visits from family members. Most children, including my own, when, they, when I was in custody, had, had problems trying to describe or explain how come their father never comes to any of the parent meetings, how come the father never comes to pick them up to school or to take them to sports day or to, to be there to watch them uh, doing their plays. Normal people's mentality is, if he's in prison, he must be a bad man. It's difficult to explain that people, that places like Guantanamo exist, where you don't have to be good or bad. You just simply exist there because people take you there. As far as his wife is concerned, she suffered several emotional and nervous breakdowns. She's had to be hospitalized a few times. But they've had a very difficult time, as anybody would, with their main breadwinner, with the father, with the husband, removed from their lives. There's something called SHU psychosis, that's secure housing unit psychosis, and it's quite well recognized in America now, that when you hold people in these sorts of cells and you take away all their human contact, um, then they just become psychotic. And, and that had clearly happened to Shaka last time I saw him. Often I've woken up in Guantanamo wishing and praying that I hadn't. Meaning that I wish that the sleep that I had and the dreams in it were so sweet that I wished it continued forever. Um, Shakir, I believe, wouldn't kill himself, but he'd let himself just go as far as um, the will to, to continue to be in this way. Uh, to no longer be, have any connection with his family. I think uh, even though he's very strong-willed and a very strong personality, that could well have uh, destroyed his will. I hope that when Guantanamo ends, uh, that we will regain a sense of history and that this will be a lesson for the future that stops us from straying again. They will close Guantanamo, but so what? That's not the end of the story. Um, you know, because there are many, many thousands of prisoners held in U.S. secret custody around the world, Guantanamo is the tiniest tip of the iceberg of that. Background air base in Afghanistan is being reinforced, rebuilt, has now far more prisoners than Guantanamo had kind of dark mirror of Guantanamo. No lawyer has ever set foot in Bagram. I also want the Supreme Court to send a message to the government that you can't set off prisons offshore that are outside the law. That, you know, you, you simply can't do that. That the U.S. government cannot act beyond the law. It's got to be answerable to the Constitution and to fairness and due process wherever you act. We need to know about the CIA secret prisons. We need to know about all these people who disappeared, these ghost prisoners who are even unluckier than Binyam Mohammed after all that happened to him. Because Binyam at least ended up in Guantanamo where there is some kind of accountability. You do justice to people and that's the best fortress that you could use against terrorism or against any cruelty really. There was a phrase that was used during the presidential election campaign by John McCain's team, which was that Barack Obama had a September the 10th mindset. They were trying to use this to suggest that he was soft on national security issues. But in many ways, actually, what America needs is to return to September the 10th, 2001. That's what they were referring to, the day before the 9-11 attacks when it was inconceivable that everything that came after would have been possible, that America would redefine torture so that it could engage in torture, when it would indulge in the industrial-scale rendition of prisoners, when it would conduct wars and deprive prisoners of the protections of the Geneva Conventions, when it would hold people and hold them neither as prisoners of war nor as criminal suspects to face a trial, but as some novel category of human being 
who had no rights whatsoever. If you debrief British nationals, British residents from all over the world who are seized by the Americans, and if you find out how comes they were seized in the first place, where did the information come from, and what information, so-called information, were they coerced with and threatened with and tortured with for the next six years, all from here. Some way or another, the same process that has to happen in the United States absolutely has to happen in Europe as well. What we're talking about here is complicity in war crimes. And whether that involved turning a blind eye while planes were passing through European airspace, turning a blind eye while airports were used in the transport of prisoners, or much more intimate involvement in exchanging intelligence or even in the capture, the rendition and the torture of prisoners. European countries have guilt on their hands. And Britain was more involved in this than anyone else. The last time I saw my son was uh, when they abducted us in Lahore and he was six months years old, I think, very young. The most precious things in a child's life to a father, I think, is seeing the child growing up in those small years. I mean, those years are really can never, can never ever, I think, be uh, substituted, not substituted, but compensated or anything like that, it can never be compensated. I mean, there is something I remember, I mean, the beauty of seeing his innocence, feelings, I couldn't describe it really, it's really beautiful. And to lose those years, now he's seven years old, I haven't seen him since, I think it is the biggest loss, I count that the biggest loss I have lost in Guantanamo, really. Not my eye, not <laughs> my broken finger, not my broken ribs, not my broken nose, not the humiliation, not the sexual abuse, not all that transport and things, all these are bad enough. But the worst, I think, uh, thing that, can, that did happen, I lost there, is not the eye, is those years of uh, seeing Suleiman uh, growing up. 